How you doing guys? Big Matt Dance here again today, back once again with another episode of my Conquest series for you. Today we'll be taking a look through the pages of issue 60. But before we get started, I just want to remind you to go and check out the Hobby Corner. And also, if you've not watched it yet, oh, I'm completely hijacking the Hobby Corner shout out that I like to do in these videos. But if you forget about the Hobby Corner, check out the Hobby Corner. Uh, the link in the description below after this video, go and check it out. But if you've not watched it yet, go and check out my uh, first showcase video of the Conquest miniatures. And again, after you've watched this video, of course, uh, I'll pop a link to that in the description below as well. It's the first lot of three intercessors that you got in the first issue of the magazine. Finally, I've got some painted and there's some nice little um, 3D printed King Fist symbols on the shoulder pads there. Um, someone asked where I got them from. I got them from Pop Goes a Monkey on Shapeways. But on to this week's magazine. It's issue 60 of Conquest. What do we get inside? We get some... Death Guard reinforcements. Um, it is sold to us as Pox Walkers arise. We get 10 more Pox Walkers and the rest of the components to complete uh, a Plague Marine. We should have kept some components from previous itu issues, not issues. Um, I'll touch on that further into this issue. Um, but on the front cover, we also get Learn About Chaos Knights and the final battle for Kalon. There's also something else in there that I'm rather fond of. We'll get to that when we get to that page. So, first off, uh, it talks about Imperial Knights. No, it doesn't. It talks about Chaos Knights. Dastardly Chaos Knights, corrupted war machines, formerly of the Imperium. Now they've gone rogue, and it could be a household that's gone rogue, or it could be an individual knight of a particular household that's gone rogue. And um, yeah, they are a huge, deadly force on the battlefield of the 41st millennium. Um, they are particularly fond of fighting other knights, um, as the Imperial Knights are fond of fighting Chaos Knights. Um, it's kind of seen as a an honour duel between the two of them, um, but that results in death for one of them more often than not. Uh, they're also renowned hunters of vehicles, uh, they're good at siege warfare and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, the battlefield role is siege warfare and they are war walkers. Uh, Speciality is heavy assault, siege warfare, anti-vehicle combat and infamous houses of dastardly chaos knights. Uh, House Lucaris, House Vextrix. That sounds weird. It seems like it should be Vectrix to me, but Vectrix, I think, is the house, because I've seen that word before. And House Chimere, I'd say, or Kim Kimere. Uh, I'm not sure. K-H-Y-M-E-R-E. -E. It might... No, I'm not going to put it on there behind you, because I'm just going to put a picture of this lovely mic um, behind me. So, um, yeah, that's how you spell it. K-H-Y-M-E-R-E. Chimere? Chimere? I'm not sure. Um, on to the next page... Pop it in the comments below a uh, phonetic, phonetic pronunciation. Um, like, make it rhyme with something. That's a good way to do it. Uh, made it make it easily understood. Uh, so on on the next page, it just gives us more information about Imperial Knights. Oh, Chaos Knights, not Imperial Knights. How many times are I going to do that? Um, so yeah, it gives us more information about Chaos Knights on the following page and how they are um, distorted and um, mutated forms of once glorious imperial war machine. Um, so over time, uh, at first when, when a pilot, it's the pilot really that falls to chaos, but the, the knight um, itself over time is then affected by chaos more and more. You might see mutations on the armor, you might see um, antlers sprouting, antlers and horns sprouting through the armor, spikes adorning the armor and stuff like that. And over time it becomes more and more um, mutated and looks more spiky, more chaosy, as um, as tends to be the case in the 41st millennium. When something's chaosy, it becomes a lot more spiky. Um, uh, before the Chaos Knight kit was released, there was lots of people converting their kits to become Chaos Knights anyway. Um, there was no rules for Chaos Knights at the time, but uh, Chaos players wanted to use these knights, so um, people were doing things like uh, the Pustules of like Nurgle, typically you see three of them together. Uh, pustules of Nurgle and um, I think the Great Jojo Man. Um, I might pop a link in the description below, but if I don't, just Google Great Jojo Man. Uh, or it might be Jojo Man. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he, he used... Um, there's a big Nurgle creature from around the end times in uh, Warhammer Fantasy, but it's still used in Age of Sigmar. Uh, and it represents one of three brothers, um, the two other brothers riding. But anyway, he took the big creature um, and 
mixed it with an Imperial Knight, if I remember rightly. And uh, it's like this Nurgle afflicted knight and it's half massive demon creature mutation and half knight. It's, uh, it's a really cool conversion. There's plenty of um, other conversions out there if you want inspiration to convert your own Imperial Knight into a Chaos Knight. Um, however, there is now a Chaos Knight kit, which uh, we can see on the following pages. We can see some examples of on these showcase pages here. Um, there's a really nice colour scheme here. Um, this is a Knight Desecrator equipped with Thunderstrike Gauntlet and Laser Destructor. Um, and it is Iron Malice, a Knight Desecrator of House Lucaris. So that's the House Lucaris colour scheme. Um, there's a Knight Rampager piloted by Decima. Um, and that is called Incarnate Slaughter, a lovely white one there with a sort of a deep red slash brown arrows um, of, I'm guessing, parts of the uh, the eight-pointed Chaos Star on top of the carapace. Uh, it's lovely. On to the next page, we've got a couple of um, knights that they don't actually have a an upgrade kit for the smaller knights, the Knight Armagers as they're known in Imperial circles. Uh, they don't have an upgrade kit for them and they don't have an upgrade kit for the Knight Castellan or the Knight... Um, what's the other big one called? I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, they they don't have an upgrade kit, but it, you'll have lots of parts left over probably from building your own Chaos Knight kit. So you can easily, if you want to build a Knight household and um, adorn your bigger Knights or your smaller Knights with um, some extra, extra spikes and stuff that you have left over from the Chaos Knight kit, then that's a, a great way to... Um, to to tie it all together, to tie your force together. Um, so there's some really simple examples there. It's, it looks less chaosy than the other ones. Uh, this big one especially, the Sire of Doom, equipped with a Volcano Lance, Plasma Decimator, Twin Siege Breaker Cannons, and Shield Breaker Missiles. Um, so it looks a bit less chaosy, but also that's where your paint job comes into play. When you're painting all these um, eight-pointed stars all over parts of the armor, or parts of the, parts of the eight-pointed star over the armor, Get some chains hanging from some of the weapons and stuff. It looks really nice and chaosy. If that's your bag. On to the next page. A glorious history. It's more Imperial Fist lore. This is what I was touching on when I said um, we got a nice surprise in here. I wasn't expecting Imperial Fist lore in this issue. But having uh, for put my uh, first showcase video up of Imperial Fist, this is good timing for me. Um, we're getting more and more lore of various Space Marine chapters. And um, this is going to slot nicely into my binder once I tear this magazine apart. Um, the millennia 30 to 31, the dawn of the Imperium, uh, the Onassis campaign. The Imperial Fist spearhead the Onassis offensive during the Great Crusade, capturing dozens of star systems for the Imperium. And then onto the defence of Terra. Uh, as decreed by the Emperor, Rogel Dawn personally oversees the fortifi fortification, or the fortifying it does say actually, yeah. The fortifying of terror after Horus's betrayal is revealed. Although various elements of the Imperial Fist still participate in numerous actions across the galaxy, including the evacuation of Mars, uh, when the War Master and his tra traitorous forces eventually reach the birthplace of mankind, Dawn and his legion have already prepared terror's defences uh, and are ready to meet the enemy in battle. So Dawn erected, he fortified what was basically a. Uh, almost like a shrine world really terror at the time um, or parts of it certainly where the imperial palace it wasn't it wasn't designed to be fortified but dawn uh, had to tear down uh, any beautiful facias and adornments of this glorious representation of mankind's achievement uh, he had to basically tear it down and then build it up and fortify it and uh, make it somewhere where they could they could easily uh, have a siege and uh, make it difficult for the enemy forces to attack. Um, and then onto the scouring. In the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, the Imperial Fists seek out and attack the traitor legions with more fervour than any other loyalist force. Rogel Dawn halts the onslaught only upon being recalled to Terra to implement the Codex Astartes. So that's uh, Gilliman's Codex Astartes um, and basically what happened there, I've touched on it in previous videos I know, uh, but just going over it again, what happened there was uh, the legions were split into chapters so no one person could control um, that kind of force of space marines as Horus did at the time and then he got all his brother legions, his brother's legions behind him or half of his brother's legions behind him as well. Um, so it's to make it harder for anyone to turn against the Imperium basically. 
Um, and the Age of Rebirth, the Iron Cage, oof, a dastardly, dastardly time for the Imperial Fists. Uh, the Iron Cage was when the Iron Warriors uh, built a mighty bastion, the Eternal Fortress, in the aftermath of the Heresy. Rogal Dawn vows to dig Petarabo out of his hole and bring him back to Terra in an Iron Cage. With the seeds of rivalry between the Iron Warriors and the Imperial Fists sown during the Great Crusade, having grown into bitter hatred, a vicious war is fought between the two legions. While the entrenched traitors fight from a superior position, the Imperial Fists refuse to die. When their ammunition runs out, they fight hand to hand and the trenches run with blood. Only the timely intervention of the Ultramarines prevent, prevent the rival legions from utterly annihilating each other. So yeah, that could have been the end of the Imperial Fists at that stage, and um, could have been the end of the Iron Warriors as well, if, if truth be told, although I'm sure they'd tell it a very different way. Um, but thankfully, uh, the Imperial Fists turned up, the heroic Imperial no, sorry, the uh, heroic Ultramarines turned up, the Blue Boys, um, to, uh, to get the Imperial Fists out of there. And uh, yeah, as, as any good brother, brother legion would do. Um, moving on, uh, just touch on a couple of things on this page. Uh, the 13th Black Crusade, the Battle Barge Storm of Wrath, leads the Imperial Fist fleet carrying five companies to strike at Iron Warriors' fortresses on Demon Worlds of Medrengard as Abaddon the Spoiler launches his 13th Black Crusade. And Fate of the Phalanx, Iron Warriors, again, uh, Iron Warriors are bitter rivals of the Imperial Fist, if you haven't gathered from some of their many conflicts that I've been reading at. Uh, Iron Warriors, alongside the Demon Prince Belakor, seek to upstage Abaddon's Crusade by striking di directly at Terra, emerging from a warp rift at the heart of the battle fortress Phalanx, they attempt to seize the mighty vessel and turn its devastating weaponry on the Emperor's palace. With the majority of the Imperial Fists engaged elsewhere, it falls upon Captain Garadon, that's Tor Garadon, we've just seen a miniature release for him, or it's on, a, it's on I think it's on pre-order at the moment, um, it's released this Saturday, um, and he's been primarized, so that's one to check out if you are unaware of it. Um, it falls to Captain Garadon and his newly rebuilt 3rd Company, alongside a small detachment of 1st Company, to repel the foe. Aided by the Legion of the Damned, they're the uh, sort of spirit space marines that are um, all skulls and flame. Um, they're not really uh, corporeal space marines, they are more like part of the Emperor's psychic will made manifest. That's one of the uh, theories anyway. Um, aided by the Legion of the Damned, the Imperial First emerged victorious, Garadon and the remnants of his force set course to Cadia, where despite their best efforts, including destroying the Blackstone Fortress Will of Eternity, the world falls to Abaddon's assault. The battered phalanx is instrumental in the final evacuation of Cadia's survivors. And uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to give you from the Imperial Fist Law. You can read the rest yourself when you get your hands on the issue. How to build Death Guard reinforcements. Building the Restless Dead. Um, and there's, uh, so the Restless Dead, um, building the restless dead and then it talks about the plague marine that you get with it so there's a body of a plague marine that you get with it and we've got parts from previous issues um two previous sprues that we've had uh to build one of two options for you so you've got the first option with the horns coming out of the head the, the sort of antlers coming out of the head and out the shoulder pads and stuff and he's holding a bolt gun or you've got a plasma gun toting guy and he's got um just a single horn coming out the top of his head and some blades coming off his shoulder pads. Um, so there's two options there for you. You've got to dig out them old pieces. Uh, it doesn't tell you which issue they came in. Um, I should have all of my sprues in a box though, so when I need those, I should be able to dig through that box and uh, find those parts that I need. Um, it's parts C16, C17, and D12, or potentially D12 comes with this actually. So we see the parts E6 or E7 for, for the bolt gun wielding marine, or C16 and C17 for the plasma gun wielding marine. On to the next page, it uh, shows you how to build the pox walkers nicely. Uh, this is a nice new set of pox walkers for us that we've not had yet, unless of course you've had the Dark Imperium box in the past. Um, and we are getting two, two of these sets of pox walkers, and that's where we get the second option for the plague marine built. Um, and then it tells, it shows you a little picture of the mole built and the two alternate builds for the uh, plague marine there as well. And it's how to paint the restless dead. Uh, just flicking through these pages quickly, it's a really simple paint job. Um, for me, the blue looks a bit. The blue doesn't look so good for me on on the 
close of the pox war because it kind of clashes with the green uh, with the death guard green that they've used on the flesh so if you wanted to paint yours green um, then I wouldn't use the blue on the clothes um, I'd be more tempted to use the green on the clothes and use like a fleshy color um, for the for the flesh um, but I'm not painting mine like this anyway you'll see how I'm painting mine in a future showcase video probably about um, three weeks away on the channel now my showcase videos are going to be released on Mondays, so you'll hopefully be seeing more showcases in the coming weeks. Um, the retreat from Kalon. So, this is a retreat from the city of Kalon on the planet of Korvon 2. Um, it's basically, it's a, it's a, what's the right phrase? It's a losing, the fighting, the losing battle, the ultramarines in Kalon. It's all infected, there's plague outbreaks everywhere all over the city. They're trying to evacuate the city. And this is one of those missions where we get a little, uh, it's like a campaign mission. You get to fight the battle five times over. Whoever wins um, the most battles wins the campaign. It's a nice short campaign. Um, and Kalon's munitions factories have been corrupted by demonic sorcery. Many have been turned to creating destructive virus bombs with which the Death Guard plan to corrupt the remaining biological life on Korvon 2. Using the third company's attack as cover for their assault, the Ultramarine strike teams must destroy these facilities before leaving Kalon to the enemy. Though Kalon has been lost to corruption, Korvon 2 can still be saved. So the planet as a whole can still be saved. And there's a, some fantastic narrative on this page uh, where it gives you the information we have from the perspective of Lieutenant Calcius um, of the third company of Ultramarines. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely little bit of narrative, so definitely read that when you get your hands on the magazine. And there's a fantastic picture here that shows us some Death Guard forces taking on some Ultramarines third company forces. Um, yeah, I really, I, I love some of the pictures they take and the way they set them up with smoke rolling across the battlefield. If you want to try and take pictures with, um, like, smoke rolling across the battlefield yourself, one interesting way I've seen it done, um, I don't vape myself, but if you vape, just blow a bit of vape smoke across the uh, across the battlefield and then take a few snaps there. If you get your lighting right, it can look really good and really effective. On to uh, the final page, which gives us the details of the mission. While the Ultramarine's third company holds the Death Guard in position, Asheron and his task force must destroy the bomb-making facilities before completing their withdrawal from Kalon. The Death Guard are prepared, however, and Lord Feltheus and his troops are ready to meet the Ultramarines. Lord Feltheus and his troops vastly outnumber the Imperial, not the Imperial Fist, um, the vastly outnumber the Ultramarines forces in this mission. It'll be Imperial Fist when I come to play it though. Um, yeah, so all together, the Imperial Fists have, I'll get onto that in a second. I'll tell you a little bit more about the battle first. The Death Guard player places two objective markers in their deployment zone. Their deployment zone is the whole of the Sector Mechanicus battle map that we've got. Um, the objective markers must be more than 6 inches from the board edge and more than 8 inches from any other objective marker. To control an objective marker, you must have more models within 3 inches of it than the enemy at the end of the game. Now, that's going to be tricky for the Ultramarine players to control the objective markers unless they wipe out a lot of the Death Guard forces, because like I said... The Death Guard forces vastly outnumber the Ultramarines in, in this case. Um, they, the Death Guard have three command points, and at the head of the force is Lord Feltheus. They have a Malignant Plague Caster, a uh, Tainted Cohort, which is three Terminator Marines, um, seven Plague Marines, 20 Pox Walkers, 10 Chaos Cultists, and a Plague Burst Crawler. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12, 32. 42, 43 miniatures for the Death Guard side. And the Space Marines consist of uh, three command points with uh, Captain in Gravis Armor, Lieutenant Calcius, Primaris Librarian. So they've got three hefty characters there. Ten Intercessors, five Hellblasters, some good weapons on the Hellblasters, and a Redemptor Dreadnought. And again, some good weapons on the Redemptor Dreadnought. It's not like it, they're fighting a losing battle or anything, but they are vastly outnumbered, the Ultramarines forces here. So altogether, that's 1, 2, 3, 13, 18... 19 models versus 43. Um, they are pretty uh, low cost models on the Death Guard side. So the Pox Walkers, if you chuck a lot of shots at them, they're going to start going down like flies, like the flies that are swarming around them on the battlefield. Um, and same goes for the Chaos Cultists, really. They're low armored, um, so they're going to be pretty easy to take out. 
once you can actually take them out. Um, I'd concentrate fire on the cultists first, probably. Just wipe that unit out if you can. Um, because there are some points to be had for the first player to take out an opposition unit. Um, the Death Guard player deploys all of their units first, so across the battle map that they control. The Space Marine player moves their units on the board at the start of their first movement phase. The Space Marine player takes the first turn. The first player to eliminate an enemy unit gains one victory point. Each enemy vehicle eliminated is one victory point. Uh, the eliminate an enemy warlord is one victory point and each objective controlled is two victory points you control the objective at the end of the game um, so if you if it's if the game is balanced on a knife edge you've really got to push your units up as the ultra room player to try and grab them objectives but don't um, don't dismiss the other ways to to gain victory points because um, if you take out an enemy unit the probably I don't know, I think the best unit to go for at first, for me, would be the Tank Chaos Cultists. You concentrate fire on them, especially with your intercessors. With with your intercessors and with your Redemptor Dreadnought, you can take out most of them, and the rest of them will probably run away. So um, so you've definitely got a chance of getting an early lead there as the Ultramarine player. Uh, but it's about getting your positioning right, and um, if the Death Guard player holds that unit back on their board edge, then... Uh, you're going to struggle to take them out in the first turn. So it's all about how the Death Guard player, as the Death Guard player, you've got to think about keeping vulnerable units away from the Ultramarine player so they go for other targets, first of all. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, it's five battles, so if you get it wrong the first time, you've got four more battles to get it right. Um, best of five wins, so you just got to get three victories as either player, and you win the campaign. On to what comes in next week's issue of Conquest, issue 61, we get the Imperial Objectives. Um, they are force field generators, um, a some kind of a shrine, uh, some ammo crates. Uh, there's like a, looks like a mini force field projector of some sort, a communications array and a medical servitor. Um, and then, the following week, we get the Galvanic Servo Haulers, which are the two tractor vehicles, the smaller ones, um, with the sort of, uh, one's got a crane arm, one's got like a, what looks like a blowtorch arm on it. So, it's going to be interesting uh, to see what I can do with those, because I've already got some, um, they should just be over there somewhere. Um, yeah, I've already got some, um, so I'll be using them in any battle reports that I do in the future, hopefully get around to doing uh, but definitely don't forget to check out the Hobby Corner and don't forget to check out my showcase video now that you've finished watching this one. I'll leave it there for now guys. See you next time and I'll see you on the battlefield.